And you're going to hear actually a little bit of redundancy. And you know, for me, redundancy is part of education. If you hear it once, you won't remember it. If you hear it twice, you may remember it. If you hear it three times, there's a little better chance you'll remember it. So that's, that's a huge part of this. So we're going to talk about a topic that is truly, in my opinion, advanced because it is male pattern baldness is the, the cornerstone, the key of this of, of this uh, course and, and other elements today are going to be topic related that you can learn and hopefully that you in, endeavor to uh, get into but I don't want you to rush into it. Female hair loss you can divide it in my head what I usually do is unstable and stable because unstable is going to be something that I'm gonna, you've already heard a lot about it from Nicole that you don't want to rush and do surgery that's obvious but things that are obvious are not that obvious unless we talk about it and things that are stable could be more surgical and that's when you start to decide whether you should do it or not and you're going to have to be a little bit of a sleuth to figure these things out so just like any good physician you're going to take a history and physical but you're going to add chemistry as needed and biopsy as needed and refer to a dermatologist as needed if you're not a dermatologist and I'm constantly enlisting the help and so when I have a woman come in I'm immediately thinking do I need to have an endocrinologist dermatologist helping me even though 30 percent of women over 30 do lose uh, lose hair so it's a very common phenomenon it's not a it's not a red herring but at the same time you got to sort of search for a red herring that's there so you already heard from Nicole uh, in terms of recent pregnancy in terms of uh, sickness general anesthesia weight loss significant weight loss fever these are things that I'm searching out for for what some kind of telogen effluvium or something else that, that could be occurring and that's when you when you find those things you don't want to launch into surgery you want to help them with some medical therapies which we'll talk about in a moment and then other histories you've already heard about also some kind of trauma extension especially in african-american patients product damage to the scalp you're looking for something there that would tell you okay wait a second maybe surgery is not the right option or maybe surgery is the right option and 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 you have to do that that history that throw history that's part of it of course physical examination is important and so with physical you divide it into for me patchy and pattern loss uh, you've already heard a lot about patchy loss and I'm not going to talk too much about it except just re reiterate a cu couple salient points and then go into pattern which is where you're going to be able to do more surgery so in terms of patchy losses consider biopsy that's a take-home lesson I'm not going to teach you dermatology as well as Nicole does my point of a little bit of redundancy is just so that you can think about this look for is it alopecia areata you know is there something going with funnel fibrosing, funnel fibrosing alopecia you've heard all the telltale signs of erythema or changes in skin the telangiectasias changes in the skin across the outer uh, temporal region loss of eyebrows before you jump in to do something make sure that you're not having CCCA or something else that would you do a surgery and then you get a disaster where nothing is growing so make sure you do that investigative work and enlist your colleagues the goal of four days here is not to teach you how to do everything you can with hair but how to be a safe surgeon how to refer appropriately and how to enlist colleagues appropriately and that's the point of this first half of the talk the um, always look something that may just look like you is you heard a crown loss or whatever maybe maybe something different so let's talk which is going to be slightly different from what you heard which is the core of this lecture is pattern losses so I want to make it very easy for for now for starting Physi physicians in the world of hair to divide it into different types so there's one is a diffuse loss which also can be called as a Ludwig classification which is just this, you just have this loss that goes across the center scalp but it can also get into the temples and it can get into your donor hair so one of the biggest issues with women is this diffuse loss that can even go into the donor area and if you look at the donor area and they've got a combination of either poor density poor caliber or even involvement you, you could be stuck with not really being able to, to do a good transplant or you have the the temples loss and the the, the backside the occipital region is still preserved then you're then you can sometimes you get able to take a wider strip shorter strip to manage it and not get into the temple areas because they just don't have enough hair there so this is one of those things that you have to be very selective in your design which we'll talk about in a moment so number one diffuse loss or Ludwig classification the second one is a variation of this uh, it was described by Elise Olson which is a Christmas tree which is when the person is looking down it looks like a, a Christmas tree in other words the, the loss is primarily in the front and extends back to the back where the apex is in the back and it can involve the hairline or it may not involve the hairline 
Uh, but when it involves this hairline in the front and it's isolated, especially when it's not African American, but it can be African American, I always worry about some kind of frontal fibrosing alopecia going on if, if it looks slightly odd in the front. And I'm always, I have a low threshold to biopsy and referral. And for me, I don't biopsy, I refer. So this is a Christmas tree pattern, which would be a, a second variant. And so when you take photography, it's very helpful to, to split in the midline and look for this and have the person look down. And the last classification is just male pattern baldness, frontal temporal recession, when it looks like a, a male pattern loss because of some of the androgens that begin to dominate with, with ongoing aging. So with the chemistry profiles that you're looking into, you want to look at, again, I don't want to play endocrinologist, dermatologist, but either you're going to draw the labs or I have a letter that sends out to say, hey, draw a full panel, look at thyroid functions, look at a, a elevated ESR or something else that could be a, a, uh, a autoimmune disease, look for iron levels, take a history in terms of menometrologia, is there, is there a lot of... Um, the, is a menses irregular that could be causing problems. Uh, these are things that, in my opinion, are very, very important. Hormonal evaluation, uh, the, the most prevalent uh, hormone in, in women is dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate. You're gonna look for that, you're gonna look at testosterone, you look at all those things. You heard from Nicole, you're looking also at whether they're on some kind of hormone replacement. And so I don't do all this stuff, I just make some preliminary uh, questions and then I want them to be optimized. So, a lot, so for hormone imbalances, it typically doesn't prevent me from surgery, but what it does is it helps me say, look, let's be optimally uh, managed. Just like if a male, you talk about finasteride and minoxidil, I'm also looking at hormonal therapy, not just medical therapy, but hormonal therapy as a way to maybe optimize that type of hair loss either before I do surgery or after I do surgery. So we go back to unstable and stable. And remember, stable is when I'm looking at uh, more of a transplant and patterned is also when I'm looking for, for transplant. When I see unstable and patchy, it's something that I'm, my red flag goes up and I'm not really interested in doing surgery. But with stable and patterned, again, de delve deeper before you just jump into it. So. Uh, these are just therapies that you can do, low-level light therapy, you can hear uh, talk, talk about it. Replacement medications, we talked about Viviscal can help with shedding, I use that for that. I have no financial affiliation with any companies. Um, you're gonna hear more this afternoon, I think, from Nicole, so I'm not gonna talk about something I, I know less about, uh, but just in general, in fact, in, in my book, I basically use all of Nicole's wisdom to uh, enter that in there. So, uh, the, so th these, are, these are things that you can do from a medical therapy. Obviously, finasteride, you're looking at, uh, at a female postmenopausal because of the risk of birth defects. That's, that may not be obvious if you're not doing hair. And some of the initial studies showed very equivocal results with finasteride. What's interesting is some of the more recent studies have shown efficacy with finasteride in women in the postmenopausal setting. For me, in general, I don't use that on a, a regular basis. The, interesting, this lady just came in this last week, and um, uh, a colleague of, of ours, uh, Bernie Nussbaum, talks about using a combination of, of steroids with his, his minoxidil. And this woman actually was on laser, was on... Um, was on minoxidil, really had no improvements over several cycles, and then I prescribed her one with this very dilute uh, betamethasone, 0.05%, and over three months, she restored so much hair that she was like, mind, was mind blown, but she started to get secondary hair growth, and she said, I don't mind shaving it off, I just want, I want all, all this hair. She stopped the steroids, and uh, I don't know how long that's, you know, I probably have to taper her down to a lower steroid dose, um, but this is something that, that Bernie doesn't like using in the long run. He usually dilutes the steroid further, further down, uses a fluticasone around eight months out, uh, so that I think it's 0.02%. But, he, but that's something that you may want to consider because some of the most recent evidence on, on a pathologic level has shown that I think 90 some percent of female hair loss has some kind of inflammatory component. So the steroids may be helpful in combination with your minoxidil therapy. So this is something that's very important is, this is a patient of mine, significant shock loss in the donor, significant shock loss in the front. I haven't seen this in years, fortunately, but this is one of those things that with women, you gotta be very, very careful. How do you minimize this? Well, you've got to look at reasons, that, ways to prevent it. So before using minoxidil can be helpful. I, I use at least six weeks for women before I consider doing, because all women can shock. Laser therapy is, is at least six weeks for me. Again, this is an arbitrary number. There's no science behind this, but the idea is that if you can at least get them stabilized, it can be very helpful in education. What's education mean? It means you may have 
shock loss afterwards. In fact, I would use the words, you will have shock loss afterwards. It's just a question of how much. So that's very, very important to discuss that. Um, during the procedure, things that you can do is, the, is reduce your epinephrine load. Now, it's, for me, it's very hard to do a, a hair surgery with no epinephrine, but reducing the epinephrine content at least by half percent, especially in the recipient area and, and even potentially in the donor area, but I really wind up just reducing it in, in the recipient area, not in my ring block and not in my, my donor, can reduce the shock because the thought is that some kind of the vascular insult from epinephrine could cause more shock. Maybe reducing the, the, the tension or the towel clamping, cutting down on, on very aggressive, rapid uh, tumescence in the recipient bed, and then really dense packing. These are things, if you do a lot of these things with high epinephrine, a lot of tension, a lot of tumescence, a lot of dense packing, you could have problems afterwards. Uh, the shock loss is one of those things that I, I warn every female about beforehand because I believe that either it's mild uh, to moderate or in rare cases significant but if you do all these things I think hopefully you can reduce that amount and what I always tell my patients beforehand are the strategies uh, afterwards that they can use to help with with minimizing this for example let's say it occurs first of all I, I tell them you can use powder if they didn't know about that because they, sometimes they just don't know the strategies. And I tell them the worst case scenario is you may have to wear a, a, a wig or something during that time of the shock loss. And I, if, you don't, if you're not exaggerating in your early, in your early phases before, they, it, you give them every, every possibility that can occur and then when it occurs they're not angry at you. And they're prepared for it, which are two important things that are there. So. Uh, afterwards, it's the same thing I just told, told you about earlier. Prevention is, is, is worth a pound of cure. Um, expectations are everything. I always say the difference between an education and an excuse. An education I tell them before and excuses I tell them afterwards. So indications for this, there's really two. It's going to be hair loss, which talked about the three kinds, the three patterns that, that exist, and also just hairline lowering, which is someone that's just born congenitally with a higher hairline that they just want a lower hairline. So these are just methods that you can do this. You just, you just harvest, as I, I told you, oftentimes in the temporal region, you may not have enough hair to do the work. But as I also said, what happens with, with women is you oftentimes just can't put hair everywhere you want. And the reason for it is limited donor and potentially extensive recipient loss. So these are just three strategies. And I usually tell women if they have a more extensive loss and they have more limited donor, and even if they don't, I want to maximize that result. You have to, to look at their hairstyle and try to figure out a way to maximize it. For example, let's say they're, they're parting to the left. And sometimes they want to part to the right. Well, I'll say, look, let's pick one side or you part to the center and I'm going to maximize this, the, this, the central forelock hair line and the part zone. That way I don't put hair everywhere and they get a result where they're not seeing a difference. So if they part to the left, I make an L shape this way. If they part to the center, I may make a T. If they part to the right, I may make a, a reverse L the other direction. So being selective and targeted in your transplant can be very effective in trying to create more consistent outcomes. This dumbbell concept is just the idea that they may have a little loss in the crown. Usually the, I, I've done crowns, you'll see some before and afters in a moment of, of female crown loss, but in general, the, the crown is usually not as significant, but there's some, sometimes a little bit of a small component. So it looks like sort of this dumbbell shape, and this is usually what, I, oftentimes what I'm designing when I'm creating a female a loss. As I, as I talked about yesterday about how hair grows, look at how hair grows in, in women as much as you look at how you look look at how hair grows in men so look at female hairline shapes these are different there's a different shape to to female hairlines and if you don't understand how hairs naturally grow with a cowlick and and how it it it, it, it cascades down the sides you're not going to be, be able to accurately create female hairlines because there are vastly different from from male hairlines and so this is a male hairline you heard yesterday all straightforward there isn't a splaying but with women it's much more uh, convol convoluted in the sense that there's sometimes it goes backwards, sometimes it goes to the side, sometimes it sweeps, and I'll do a little bit of a, a quick demo up there. Again, this is a male hairline going more forward, and this is a more female hairline being more radial in nature. Is it always this? No. But this is one of the ways that you can, can make it design. That's helpful. And this is just showing you uh, creating more central density, that sort of T-shaped design in the midline. This is a, some before and afters. This is a, a, a female hairline lowering for someone born with a high hairline. Uh, this is just showing a top view of that. This is a male pattern uh, baldness that was corrected. This is a, a, a bodybuilder that was on steroids, male androgens that have lost, and has a male pattern baldness and recreating that. 
and this is uh, another male pattern baldness uh, in an uh, Asian. This is just showing you some, some, a little bit of SMP along with the hair transplant to create a, a, a more favorable outcome. This is traction alopecia, you heard that from Nicole, reframing the face, although she looks a little happier before my procedure, I don't know why. Um, this is a, a, a transgender patient just starting to create a, a little bit uh, better, f more female shape. This took multiple sessions because, you know, I first had to, to make the, that, that, that transformation possible because of significant hair loss. And sometimes when you're dealing with transgender patients, they want the flexibility to, to actually be male sometimes and female sometimes, so you don't want to create an aggressive female hairline. And that's some of the, the nuances I'll be actually discussing at one of the, uh, the morning breakfast tables at, uh, in, in Las Vegas. And then the biggest thing that I've seen now in the last two years is, this, is a lot of these people that have been overplucked in the past that now have created these eyebrows using laser, sorry, using a tattoo that in a very unfavorable way and they come back and they transplant over, over this area. So there's just an eyebrow transplant to fix that. This is diffuse pattern loss. This is not a perfect result. There's still a lot of see-through, but at least there's uh, enough that the person could maybe use some powder, not have to wear a wig or feel more comfortable in public. Uh, this is uh, again a diffuse loss, more sort of a, a Christmas tree pattern, but this is actually a little bit more extensive. It's in between a Christmas tree pattern to a, a more diffuse loss. And this is that more Christmas tree pattern that we showed before. So we'll just show a quick demo up here. Any questions as I go up here? Okay, let's see if I can. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, is show you some recipient sites. Tell, put on your 3D glasses. Oh, do you guys have your glasses? I should have checked on that this morning. Everyone have their, if you don't have your glasses, raise your hand, we'll get you a, a glass. I think no one has their glasses, right? All right, so the, it's not so important that you have your 3D glasses. Even just the whole design of this is, 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 is going to be fine. Um, just seeing just in general how I make a recipient site for especially for some people that didn't watch me do recipient sites I think this is helpful. So a lot of times what happens is uh, besides the actual shape of the, the hairline being like this you know coming down what I like to do in a lot of people that don't have a hairline is to recreate one that really looks that will, that will work well for them. If they have a really existing hairline, I'm going to try to emulate that and build forward from it. But what you don't want to do in many cases is just create this straight hairline going forward. So I do a little bit of a, of a whorl and a little bit of, of, of shaping like this. So what I'll do is this hairline where there's, it just angles sideways like this, okay? Can you, can you guys see that or no? I'm, not, I'm really trying to do two things at one time and see. Can you sort of see it? Well, just picture this being the, the hairline, okay? I'm doing the hairline more than anything else. And then as I go over to the side, okay, I'm skipping over here pretty quickly here. All I'm doing is showing you that it starts to go down this way. Now, we're going... This continues down this way, but my point of this is that a lot of times when I'm doing a female hairline, I create a cowlick that's not just straightforward, okay? And then this part where there's a part zone, I angle like this and start to go down this direction like this. And again, this is one of many designs that are possible with a woman. But my point of this is not for you to memorize exactly what I'm doing, but just to show you and illustrate the differences in male hairline design uh, in it, from a female uh, pattern and why what I told you don't splay with a male, you're actually creating almost this intentional splay with a female, but very different. It's going almost like a cowlick and creating this shape change. That is something why this is much more sophisticated and I recommend not starting with this. And even in lab, if you're really brand new to this, which most of you are, to really get down the male hairline. You may think after one or two attempts that you're already very good at it, but you really need more time to, to mature that. So continue to practice on male hairlines. If you want to do some female hairlines today, you're welcome to, to do some, but I really want you to prove to me that you're uh, proficient with the male hairline.